Welcome to this lecture series in group theory. In this lecture, we'll be discussing the automorphism groups of permutation groups. And let us recall a few things that we need. So first thing we need is that transpositions generate SN. Um, <clears throat> then we saw that if we have a permutation in SN, then the order of that permutation can be calculated by taking the LCM of the length of the cycles appearing in the cycle representation of sigma. All right, and then we have the simple fact that if you conjugate a K cycle by, a, by some permutation sigma, then you get another K cycle in this fashion. So this is called a conjugate of that. Similarly, if you take a conjugate of this guy, let's say you take the conjugate by sigma, then you get that. And this follows from the previous one because <clears throat> you can write this as sigma, then the first K cycle, then the second L cycle, sigma inverse. So we just insert this guy in the middle because this is identity. So this part gives us that and the second part gives us that. So anyway, this, this follows from the previous one. All right, here are two problems and I'll be using both of them. Therefore, I have marked them with star. The first one shows that, well, we know that all the transpositions generate SN, but this first exercise shows that you don't need all the transpositions. Just this small list suffices. Okay, the second problem is very interesting. It's a counting problem, essentially. So here you fix a positive integer, what have I written, this is n is greater than or equal to one. You fix a positive integer and some k with, in this range, in this range, and define tk to be the set of all those permutations whose cycle representation features exactly k transpositions and no other cycles, apart from the trivial cycles, of course. So precise definition has been written. And the first uh, problem shows that the order two elements are precisely the elements of ti's. So that's that. And the second one is a counting problem. So this is the expression for the number of elements in tk. And this is equal to that is a simple rearrangement. The third one requires some thought. It just follows by some basic estimates. This is n choose two, that's clear. This is whatever. So if you could just estimate these things and show that they are large, they will be large because this grows only linearly with n and this goes quadratically. So these will be large except for possibly, you know, the last few terms. In fact, you can show that except for the last term here, everything is at least greater than one. And this guy can not be smaller than half. So with those things in hand, you can show that for large value of n and by large, I mean something like seven, eight, whatever. That this cannot happen and maybe then for n equals six or something you can do some ad hoc argument uh so not six n equals seven you can do some ad hoc argument and for other n's yes. so for small n's you can just do things by hand uh unfortunately for n equals six these two things are i mean can be equal so that's a strange kind of discrepancy but it is what it is all right so let us define inner automorphisms we have looked at this concept earlier but we did not give it a name so fix a group G, and then for little g in capital G, we define a map phi sub G going from G to G as phi G of X is G X G inverse for all X in the group. So basically this is conjugation by G, that map, and easy to check that this is an automorphism of G. Uh, these are called inner automorphisms. Any such automorphism, meaning you pick a G and create that automorphism. These are called inner automorphisms. Okay. Uh, note that if we define this map, capital Phi as Phi of G equals Phi sub G. Well, I should write defined as defined uh, defined as that is a homomorphism. So this is a group homomorphism, easy to check. Image of phi, image of capital phi is inner automorphisms. This is just a notation. Uh, this The terminology is inner automorphisms of the group. All right, uh, what is the kernel? I leave you to check that the kernel of phi, this is an exercise, 
is the center of the group and this shows that g mod center of the group is isomorphic to inner automorphisms so check that and then prove this via the first isomorphism theorem so so much about inner automorphisms now let us look at a particular instance of inner automorphisms in the context of permutation groups so x is any set and sigma is any permutation of this group which we are calling g so now if we have another permutation tau basically we are trying to capture what is phi sigma the question is what, how do we look at phi sigma so if we have any permutation tau note that if we make this diagram then what is this arrow this arrow is nothing but sigma tau sigma inverse i hope that is correct um you first do a sigma inverse then you do a tau and then you do a sigma very very strange wait a second give me a second so first you go from here to here then you go here and then you go here yeah this is correct so this is uh, basically this diagram basically tells us what is the conjugation of tau, tau by sigma conceptually what is happening is sigma is changing the names of things that's all sigma is doing and tau is permuting the things in x so whatever way tau is permuting the things in x the same way this is also permuting the things in x except after a name change so ponder upon that comment all right let's move on so the rest of the lecture is about characterizing automorphism groups of permutation groups basically our agenda is to show that automorphism group of sn is actually the same as the inner automorphism group of sn except for n equals six so let's get started uh, fix an automorphism of Sn, n is some positive integer. Uh, then we show that it will be an inter inner automorphism if and only if it preserves transpositions. It takes each transposition to another transposition. Okay, so that is our goal. And here is the thing. Uh, it is clear that if phi is an inner automorphism, then it takes a transposition to a transposition because if you conjugate a transposition by sigma, you get another transposition simply because of the recall we saw. So say tau is uh, i comma j or i j this particular transposition then what is that this is equal to sigma i sigma j and this is what we saw in the recall so a transposition is going to a transposition under conjugation by any given element and therefore one direction of this claim is trivial we will do the less trivial direction so let phi or assume phi preserves transpositions So under this assumption we need to show that it is an inner automorphism all right so therefore the image of this particular transposition is going to be some transposition let's call it a1 a2 so a1 and a2 are distinct integers in fact they lie in this range i don't want to say that every time okay what about this guy well these two transpositions do not commute and therefore since phi is an automorphism these two also cannot commute now whatever this image might be the image could be let's say b1 b2 since these two do not commute they should share at least one of the things you know they cannot be disjoint transpositions because disjoint cycles commute so it has at least one thing in common and it cannot have both things in common because then the two things would be equal and they cannot be equal because the, these two things are different and phi is a bijection so this is of the form a2 a3 and a1 a2 and a3 are pairwise distinct similarly what is this guy this is this has to have one thing in common you know whatever is the image it has to have at least one thing in common from here but nothing in common from here because these two things commute and therefore these two things also must commute which means they are disjoint cycles all right so a2 cannot appear here a2 cannot appear here because that is common with that so a3 must appear here and a1 also cannot appear here so it is some other new element a4 that will come so a1 a2 a3 a4 are pairwise distinct and just keep going this way so phi n minus 1 n is some a n minus 1 a n okay and now define sigma as sigma i equals a i for all i so we have defined a permutation and just now we check that 
pi sigma of i i plus 1 or let me be a little bit concrete it's easier to follow pi sigma of 1 2 is what it's sigma 1 2 sigma inverse which is sigma 1 sigma 2 which by definition of sigma is a1 a2 which is equal to phi 1 2 so we see that phi sigma and phi agree on this particular transposition and you can by the same reasoning show that actually they agree on each of these transpositions and now if you look at the star mark problem if you look at the star mark problem you will see that these transpositions generate the entire group of permutations meaning they generate sn and so we see that phi sigma and phi agree on a list of generators which implies that phi sigma is actually equal to sigma uh, phi right because these are two automorphisms which agree on generators therefore they must be equal and we have shown that phi indeed is an inner automorphism all right wonderful and now for some a little bit uh, somewhat technical looking lemma so it says that suppose we have a positive integer and an automorphism of sn then there is a positive integer such that the image of the set of all transpositions is contained in tk so what is t1 and what is tk look at the second star mark problem t1 is the set of all the transpositions tk is the set of all those permutations of uh, you know all those permutations in sn whose cycle representation features exactly k transpositions and no other non-trivial cycles so look at that problem for a more you know in-depth definition but that's a precise definition what i just said so what we are trying to say is that phi takes a trans if, if phi takes let's say one transposition to some tk then it takes all the transpositions to the same tk right so that's the that's the statement and yeah before you i even say that i should mention everything in t1 is an order two element so if you pick a transposition it is going to another order two element and again by the second star mark problem the set of elements of order two are precisely these guys and therefore any transposition under phi will map to some tk this problem says that two different transpositions cannot map to two different tks okay enough about that now let us uh, try to give a proof all right so say uh, let tau be this particular transposition just fix one concrete one and phi tau is in tk for some k again one might, might one might ask why should tau phi tau land in some tk as i as i said tau is an element of order 2 so phi tau is also an element of order 2 and therefore since the elements of order 2 are nothing but the things lying in some ti phi tau must lie in some some tk okay now let um, theta equal ij some some transposition and we will show that phi theta is also in tk so let sigma in sn be such that sigma 1 is i and sigma 2 is j then theta equals sigma tau sigma inverse right <laughs> right thus phi theta equals phi sigma phi tau phi sigma inverse equals well nothing nothing to say so this is an element of tk and we are conjugating it by some element of sn so if this features exactly k disjoint or rather if the cycle representation of this guy features exactly k transpositions and no other non-trivial cycles same is true for this just look at the recall and you will understand so therefore phi theta also belongs to tk and we are done so if one transposition let's say this particular one goes to tk then every other transposition must go to tk the whole uh, idea of the proof is that any two transpositions are conjugate which is the step any two transpositions are conjugate and therefore their images are also conjugate and if one thing is in tk then everything conjugate to it is also in tk 
So th those are basically the steps of the proof. So we have that. Uh, by the same reasoning, one can show a little bit more general thing. So same as before, n is a positive integer and phi is an automorphism of Sn. L be some positive integer again in this range. Uh, then uh, there is some k greater than one such that the image of TL under phi is contained in TK. And let, let this range not throw you off because L outside this range doesn't make sense because in the cycle representation of uh, any element of TL, you're, you're seeing L transpositions. So if L were greater, 2L were greater than N, then that would mean, if you, if you pick an element of TL, that would mean that you have more than N different symbols appearing there and that's not possible. So this range is not losing any generality or any, any such thing. All right, so the point is that in the previous uh, lemma, we had L equals one. Here we are having a more general L, but the argument is exactly the same, right? So, so figure this out if it, it is not clear. And now we can show the main corollary that we need to finish this lecture is that again, we have a positive integer N and an automorphism of SN. Then we want to show that there is a K greater than one such that equality happens. So it strengthens our penultimate lemma that we just discussed. This in, this in particular implies that the size of T1 is same as the size of TK because phi is a bijection. Uh, so that immediately follows from this. So why indeed this happens? Well, say phi T1 is contained in TK by the previous to previous lemma. So then by the previous lemma, phi inverse tk should be contained in t1. Now, why is that? Because, well, phi inverse is also an automorphism. So phi inverse tk is contained in some, t, some, some tl by the previous lemma. But at least one element here is in t1 because phi t1 is going to going inside tk. So phi inverse tk has elements which are going inside t1. So the entirety of tk must go inside t1 under phi inverse. So just these two containments give you phi t1 equals tk since uh, phi, is a <coughs> phi is a bijection and whatnot. So the point is that cardinality of t1 equals cardinality of tk. Right? If, if phi t1 equals tk, then cardinality of t1 equals cardinality of tk. So that's basically the main, main result that we want to use. So let's finish the proof of the fact that we want. If n is not six, then automorphism group of Sn is just inner automorphism group of Sn. So let phi be some automorphism of Sn. Then uh, we want to show that it is an inner automorphism. We will do it by showing that image of every transposition under phi is a transposition. So this was one of the lemmas. Uh, an automorphism is an inner automorphism if and only if it preserves transposition. Okay, so phi of t1 is equal to tk for some k by the previous lemma. Thus, cardinality of t1 equals cardinality of tk. This is also what we saw. But this implies by the second star mark problem that k equals 1. Because n is not equal to 6, we can use the second star mark problem to show that k is equal to 1. Thus, phi t1 equals t1. And since t1 is precisely the set of all the transpositions, we can write phi preserves transpositions, which implies phi is an inner automorphism. And that's it. It's a very simple, sweet proof, although it uses a lot of work that was done earlier. So that's a beautiful proof to show that ot Sn is in Sn whenever n is not equal to 6. When n is equal to 6, indeed, one can find automorphisms of S6 which are not inner, and that's, well, that's how things are. That's just what it is. And with that, I want to end this lecture. As usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.